I'm just thinking about all of the seriously famous true crime YouTubers who have like, just forget everything that you know about the Silent Twins. Forget all of it because this is not a ghost story. It's just so disrespectful. Anyway. What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you are new here, welcome to my channel and welcome back to another True Crime Sunday. I just want to start off by saying that this is not the typical true crime YouTuber story of the Silent Twins. This could either be a good thing or a bad thing, but I've woken up in the most horrible mood. I had a really hard time last night. If it looks like I've got an attitude I already do have an attitude about this case and it's exacerbated by the mood that I woke up in. I used to look up to true crime YouTubers until I started doing research of my own and this is probably one of the worst cases of where true crime YouTubers have taken a really sad case and tried to make it sound as creepy and spooky as possible. I'm just like thinking about all the different true crime YouTubers who I've heard the same recycled Wikipedia story from who did absolutely no effort in trying to tell the real story. And so I, today, am going to attempt to try and tell the real story of the Silent Twins. Just forget everything that you know about the Silent Twins. Forget all of it because this is not a ghost story. And it's hardly a true crime story. Honestly, the true crime here is what true crime YouTubers have done to this case. It's not even really a case. So we're talking about the Gibbon sisters. Um, we're talking about June and Jennifer Gibbons, and they're known as the Silent Twins. Both born on 11th of April, 1963. They're identical twins. They were born to Gloria and Aubrey, who are their mum and dad, and the family moved from Barbados to the UK in the early 60s. So Gloria, their mum, was a housemaker, a housewife, and their father Aubrey was in the Royal Air Force, and when Gloria was pregnant with the twins, Aubrey was deployed in Yemen, and so that is where Gloria gave birth to the twins. And that's when they moved to the UK. Now June and Jennifer had a speech impediment, and on top of that they spoke a sped up version of Bayesian Creole. Now, this is where I'm gonna jump in and say my first discrepancy. A lot of true crime YouTubers say that the Silent Twins had their own made-up language that nobody could understand, and it was this creepy sort of thing where they would only communicate with each other. When in fact, the Silent Twins, June and Jennifer, actually spoke a, like, it's kind of like when Rihanna did her song Work and everyone was like, oh my god, why is she just singing nonsense words, like gibberish words? Rihanna is actually from Barbados and the words, or at least the dialect she's using in her song Work, is from Barbados. It's native to Barbados. Silent Twins were doing the same thing. It was not a made up nonsense gibberish language that only they could understand. It was a sped up version of Bayesian Creole and also their little sister sister Rose could understand what they were saying and their parents had trouble understanding what they were saying because it was a sped up version and on top of that the, the twins had a speech impediment. June and Jennifer were also the only black kids in their school and they were traumatized, absolutely traumatized by the bullying that happened. I mean, I'm sure you can imagine. Back in those days, and even to this day, racial prejudice runs high. But I'm sure you can imagine back then, those girls were traumatized by the white kids in that school. So much so that the teachers had to dismiss June and Jennifer to give them like a head start so that they could get away from the other kids. So they got a, a, a five minute head start to get home before all the other kids were released from school. It would be later, after being so heavily traumatized by these other kids, that June and Jennifer felt quite isolated. And so their language, I guess, got sped up and they would stop speaking around other kids. They'd be more or less silent 
around the other kids, but they still spoke to their sister Rose and they still played with their little sister Rose and Rose could understand what they were saying. But they were also kind of like, you know, how twins or even just sisters are. They were like that. And so when their parents would ask them a question, it would always be like June and Jennifer would always, I guess, consult with each other. They were like this, but it wasn't like a weird thing. You know what I'm saying? And their father has said that he just chalked that down to them being twins. Or like just very close. So June would later say that because they had a speech impediment and people kept asking them to repeat themselves, they got frustrated and decided to just not talk to anyone. It was kind of like a protest because they were so frustrated with having to repeat themselves. June would say things like, everyone just kept saying, what was that? What, say that again? Like, and it made them feel kind of frustrated always having to repeat themselves. At school, they protested by refusing to read and refusing to write. And then one day when the, I guess they were doing vaccinations, one of the nurses realized that the these two girls were, I guess, extremely passive and they referred them on to a child psychologist. Every psychologist that worked with June and Jennifer were pretty unsuccessful in getting them to communicate with the other kids. And so from there, at age 14, both June and Jennifer were sent to a special education school. So the previous school they were at sent over their reports to the new teacher at the special ed school, who I guess wasn't going to be working with them one-on-one -on -one because they're twins, but was going to be working on them one-on-two. So when the new teacher got these reports, they said that the twins refused to talk to anyone and they were mute and that they were negative and like all of this stuff. But the teacher later realized that this wasn't exactly true. It was more so the circumstance that they were in in the previous school. The new teacher found that June and Jennifer did in fact speak. And when slowed down, in actuality, they were speaking English. In the special ed school, June and Jennifer were unknowingly recorded or like filmed through a two-way mirror. A lot of people say that these, because there are tapes out there, that this is more like an experiment rather than like, I don't know, it very much looks like they were running experiments on June and Jennifer. Like not anything crazy, but just, you know, these days you wouldn't, be able to get away with that. You, you have to have consent when filming people. And even when you do experiments on people, they have to be like knowingly and willingly taking part. So by filming June and Jennifer through a two-way mirror and leaving the room, she realized that they spoke quite freely when there was no one else around. So this teacher worked with them quite closely and realized that the twins were making progress and even saw that the twins had their own personality, which they didn't really get a chance to see when they weren't working with them so closely and so diligently. The twins wouldn't eat in front of people and when they did eat in front of people, like one of the tapes where the school was filming them shows that June and Jennifer were in the cafeteria and eating extremely slowly. They weren't really making any expressions or anything and the voiceover was like, they're expressionless while they eat and look at all of the other children who have finished their meal and are getting ready for bed while June and Jennifer are still on their first meal. Later on, as an adult, June would be shown these tapes and she would be like, oh, we were actually not talking to each other that day. And so we were kind of in a mood and it was almost like a game to us to who could eat the slowest. As much as people would like to say that this was like creepy and spooky, when you have all the information and you're not just selectively giving people information, like the fact that June came out later and said, oh, like this is actually what was going on. We weren't like being creepy. Like when she explains it, it's not a creepy thing at all. It's like they're just doing what children do. They were angry at each other, they're twins, and it was kind of like a game. Anyway. Both June and Jennifer had diaries. They loved to write. And in this special ed school, they were writing letters and writing in their diaries. And I guess the special ed school, while also doing experiments on them and filming them, were also reading their diary because we have excerpts from their diaries and excerpts from their letters, which were talking about 
as in both twins had separately written that they felt that they wanted to be separated, that they didn't feel like they wanted to be treated as twins. They wanted to be treated as individuals. And in the letters, they were saying things like, I know that people think that we want to be together, but we actually feel like we'd be better off for everyone. It would be better off if we were separated. In the letters, they spoke of how much they felt that they had to rely on each other and that it was just like they played silly games with each other and it made everyone else think that they were crazy when this stuff would only happen when they were together because they feel like they're bad influences on each other. So with the special ed school, I guess, reading their diaries and reading their letters, they decided they were actually going to separate the girls and see what happened but they gave the girls the power to choose which one would stay at this school and which one would go to a different school and this caused issues between the twins they started to fight about which one would stay and which one would go because obviously both of them had gotten really comfortable with their new teacher here and I guess you know they they couldn't decide on which one was going to leave both of them wanted to stay and it got to the point where the twins were shouting at each other. And the teacher who would be interviewed about this later would be like, it was just so, you know, weird. Or I guess it was just such a shock that these two girls who wouldn't talk to anyone else and would, you know, always talk to each other were now shouting at each other. And it was just a sight to see. He would recall Jennifer almost chanting at June being like, you are Jennifer, you are Jennifer, which to me, that is a little bit scary, but it is easily explained, I guess, with child psychology, um, especially with twins. They feel like they are each other. And I guess Jennifer was taunting June. Jennifer also wrote things in her diary that was like, you know, I don't think that June is my twin because if she was my twin, we would be exactly alike and she would like the things that I like and she would want to do the things that I do, but June never wants to do what I want to do. And so I don't even feel like she's my twin. And she also said things like, you know, June is shorter than her and, and you know, the typical things that twins hold over each other. Like, you know, I'm taller than you and I was also born before you, which means I'm older. So typical twin stuff in Jennifer's diary. So when June and Jennifer were separated from each other, June took it really hard. She stopped eating, she stopped moving, she would sit on her bed and just like cry, but not wipe the tears away or like the snot away. And so it would just like hang from her face. She stopped dressing herself and she also stopped going to the toilet. And I guess the teachers were kind of like, this is ridiculous. Um, we can't let this go on any longer. We can tell that they're just crying out for attention, but maybe we should reunite them. So the separation experiment was a complete failure. Um, it just seriously distressed the girls and it really wasn't working. So both June and Jennifer left their respective special education schools and came home and they were reunited. But they began isolating themselves in their bedroom and this went on for a couple of years. They even had binoculars where they could, I guess, like see the outside world from their bedroom. They weren't alone though. They shared a bedroom with their little sister, Rosie, and they still played with Rosie. Um, they would have these like elaborate plays that they would tape themselves doing, like Rosie was included, like Rosie would play a character, June would play a character, and Jennifer would play a character, and they all had a whole bunch of fun. And just FYI, I've heard some of these tapes, and I know that everyone says that, oh my God, they were so hard to understand. But seriously, I could understand everything they were saying. And it just kind of sounded like, I mean, they had a speech impediment. It just sounded like similar to, I was in a grade called Senior Silver because I needed some extra support in primary school. And we had a deaf girl in our class and she spoke and I could understand everything that she was saying. It just sounded like she had a bit of a speech impediment. And that is exactly how June and Jennifer sounded. So I think it's a really big cop out for people to say that they couldn't understand them speaking. Like I've heard the tapes. I can understand everything that they were saying. I think people were just being rude. So June and Jennifer would make these tapes of these plays for their little sister, Rosie, and they continued doing so until Rosie was 11. And that's when Rosie moved out of the bedroom. 
And that's also when June and Jennifer stopped talking to Rosie. They also weren't talking to their other siblings, but this was when they stopped talking to Rosie, which really hurt her. She would later say that it actually really hurt her, but you know, it was just the situation. On the Christmas of 1979, June and Jennifer would get matching diaries for Christmas. And this is where their love for writing poetry, writing plays, like script writing and writing little stories really came about. Their writing was very elaborate. And a lot of people like to say that their writing was like, oh my God, it's so creepy and spooky and scary. But I mean, it just really sounds like they've got a really imaginative, creative mind. Like some examples are the Pepsi Cola Addict and also there are other examples online, but I'm just gonna give you a few. Um, so Pepsi Cola Addict was the title of their little story and it was about a high school hero that is seduced by a teacher and then sent away to a reformatory school where a homosexual guard makes a play for him. There's Pug Pugilist, which was a story about a physician who kills his dog to take the heart because his child needed a heart transplant and he wanted to save his child's life. And then the spirit of the dog lived on in the child and the spirit of the dog within the child wanted to get revenge on the dad. So I mean, yeah, I mean, they are very elaborate. I don't think they're spooky. I think these are just girls who are like looking for, I think the girls were just being creative. Like I don't think that this is in any way twisted. I think there are people who make weirder things out there and are considered completely normal or like arty. So the twins at this point were, I guess, silent because they had made a pact when they were so young that they didn't want to talk you know they didn't want to talk to other people because they felt so isolated and they had been so traumatized that now this silence has kind of become a really bad habit and no matter what any true crime youtuber wants to say about this part in june and jennifer's life they actively tried to learn how to talk again because they never really got the conversational skills that you and I would develop as being a child because, because of how they were treated and because of how they chose to deal with their trauma by just not talking. They didn't have the communicative skills that you and I have to have normal conversations. So what they decided to do was enroll in a course and the course's name was The Art of Conversation. So this course was supposed to teach them like, what to say, when to say it, like, oh, the weather and all this kind of stuff. But June and Jennifer found it too hard. It wasn't a course where they went in. It was more so a course that they paid for and they received the book in the mail and they tried to do it themselves. They didn't have any help. And so they gave up. It was too hard and yeah. So at this point, the girls were like, we feel like failures. We can't speak. We don't know how to talk to people. And they were really burdened by the fact that they wanted to make their parents proud by doing something with their lives. They were getting older and they hadn't done anything and they felt like such a burden, especially to their mother. This part is something that I've never seen any of these true crime YouTubers talk about. Like they, these girls actively tried. It's not like they were creepy little twins that just didn't talk to anyone and were like little demon children like they were actively trying to make progress so because they didn't really have any luck in doing that course they decided that they wanted to buy a typewriter and type out their stories and send them off to be published they didn't really get anywhere in terms of being published in any you know journals or anything like that but they did pull together their unemployment checks and self-published their work. And when they turned 18, they couldn't handle it any longer. Their self-imprisonment was paralyzing. They were so bored. And they also kind of got obsessed with these boys who were also twins, who were an extremely bad influence on June and Jennifer. And June and Jennifer were obsessed. They fell in love with these boys. Their diaries speak of how they fought over the boys and how, you know, they were fighting so much and they, you know, I just wanted to kill my sister. I tried to kill my sister, blah, blah, blah. It was a really rough time in their lives, but they also did describe this summer as being one of the best summers that they had ever lived. And these boys were a really bad influence 
on June and Jennifer. These boys would do things like steal, they'd set things on fire, and they also you know, probably used June and Jennifer for a really long time. Even though June and Jennifer were like, you know, falling in love with these other twins, at some stage, these boys just got up and left. Like, they peaced out on June and Jennifer and it broke their heart. That's when the twins got into, I guess, you know, alcohol and started experimenting with drugs. And this led on a really bad tide of behaviors, which included things like stealing and setting things on fire, like the boys had done. They set fire to a building in town and it was a pretty extreme fire. They made the mistake of writing about it in their diaries and in their diaries they were like, you know, don't we get to take out some of our trauma on, you know, it's pretty clear that they were needing some help and that's why they set this fire. Um, they were kind of proud of setting the fire as well. It was almost like a boasting kind of entry. So because they needed to rebel and boast about it in their diaries, that's actually how they were caught. So the police used their diaries as a confession and used it at trial. But before they were sentenced, they were held in the same cells, um, which wasn't the greatest idea. The girls would fight amongst each other and they would need to be separated and then they were inconsolable. So they were put back in the same cell and then they would fight each other again. You know, just like angry, rebellious girls, sisters who needed some special attention, but were also, you know, like normal teenage sisters who are that close are going to fight anyway. But these girls also had a lot of undealt with trauma. They were being kept in a cell. Like the circumstance just was not great. So, so being apart wasn't an option and being together wasn't an option. It was just, you couldn't win. That's when the twins stopped talking to other people again. And that might have also been because of, you know, what their lawyers might have told them. But even with their lawyers and their doctors, they would only speak to them through phone. The girls spoke to the doctors separately about contrastingly different things. Um, Jennifer would talk to her doctor about, you know, how much she hates her sister and, you know, she wants to kill her sister and she hears voices. Whereas June would talk to her doctor about things like, you know, her feelings. And June would also say that she felt like she had premonitions. Now the psychiatrist who I guess was probably like the jail or prison psychiatrist was also an adult psychiatrist who wasn't really fit to be dealing with these girls. But you know, that day and age, they're like, whatever, doesn't really matter. They don't, I don't think they really had um, a clear understanding on, he was treating June and Jennifer as if they were adults. Like they were, they were young adults, but they weren't adults, adults. But he said that they were just schizophrenics and that they were a danger to other people and they were just psychos. But their doctor, and I think he was also working with them in the special ed school, um, actually disagreed with the adult psychiatrist and he was like, no, they are not going to get the help that they need in prison. They shouldn't be in prison. At trial, June and Jennifer did plead guilty and they were sentenced to a high security uh, mental health hospital indefinitely. So this was Broadmoor and their father would talk about how I guess traumatizing it was actually trying to visit his daughters in Broadmoor. It was a really high security, I guess, like scary. It, it would have been traumatizing either way. Contrastingly, you've got June and Jennifer who are girls who wouldn't really talk to anyone and they were just sad from obviously their trauma. Going into a place where you've got people who have actually murdered other people, who are screaming, who are doing all of this stuff. This is a high security mental health hospital. So June and Jennifer were actually kept on separate wards for two years and they were both given tranquilizers. So the tranquilizer they were given was for schizophrenia and June would say that it kind of like wiped away the shyness. It made her feel numb. They didn't feel shy anymore and they both started talking. And their mother would say that she didn't think that June and Jennifer were mental. She said that 
they just needed special help that they weren't getting. Here's another discrepancy that true crime YouTubers would leave out to make this story seem spooky. They say that June and Jennifer would be on separate wards, but they would almost mimic each other even though they couldn't see each other. That is completely untrue. I don't know where they're getting this from, but it is completely untrue. They were kept on separate wards, but they did visit each other. They did write to each other every day. They spoke to each other on the phone. They literally visited each other every single day. And at this point, they were speaking freely to each other and to everyone else. They had made so much progress by being in this facility and I guess even just being on separate wards and having the freedom to visit each other and getting specialized help that they were appealing their sentence. They had been in there for years and years and years. They felt like they had made that much progress that every time they appealed and they were knocked back they were told you just need to make a little bit more progress and they kept getting knocked back until their 12th year of being in this facility until they asked to be maybe moved to a less high security mental health hospital and that's when they agreed to let them. So this was approved a month before their 30th birthday. They had spent 12 years in Broadmoor. The day before they were meant to leave, Jennifer was complaining about feeling weak, she was feeling sick, she was feeling tired, and that's another thing that true crime YouTubers will leave out. They don't even mention that she was sick previous to leaving. But yes, Jennifer was actually sick previous to leaving the hospital. True crime YouTubers say that in the car when June and Jennifer were being moved to the new hospital that Jennifer just suddenly died. Not true, you guys. That is absolutely not true. She didn't just randomly die, and they use that to make this story sound more spooky. No. Jennifer and June were in the car. Jennifer fell asleep on June's shoulder. She did make it to the other hospital, but... She would lay in bed for a couple of days really, really sick, and then she would pass away. Jennifer had a heart condition, and it was where her heart muscle was inflamed. Now, usually this condition isn't fatal, and they're not quite sure, you know, how it got this bad, but June says that it was the treatment at Broadmoor that exacerbated her sister's condition, and she believes that Broadmoor made her sister's condition bad to the point where she had passed away from it. June is still alive to this day and she says that she kept her sister's dress and the items that she was wearing on the day that she died as sort of like um, like a memory of her sister. And although she felt grief, she also said that she was almost like released from like the expectations of being a twin, from the expectations of her sister. YouTubers have taken this and tried to make it more spooky and say that, oh, June said that she's finally released from this spell and can now automatically live a normal life the second her sister died. That is so disrespectful and so untrue. June has spoken so lovingly of her sister and that is so not what she meant. And I'm I'm disgusted that people would try and spin this story that way. June said that she felt so heartbroken that her sister, obviously her sister had died. She felt grief, but she also felt like the expectations of like, you know, being expected to be like this twin, not just from other people, but from her sister, Jennifer. She wanted to be an individual. June stayed in the lesser high security mental health hospital and she was later released and she has like this huge party where like her parents came and everyone wished her the best of luck in her you know new life and there was like lots of food lots of cake and also the special ed teacher who worked with the girls when they were in the special ed school who spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the girls came back and showed June the tapes of when she was in that school when she was a child and this is when we see june being like oh no we were actually like playing a game then and it's just really interesting and a little bit i don't know beautiful to see june as an adult watching herself back on those times when she was a child and even just seeing her interact with that old teacher is just quite sweet so june lives a relatively normal life these days and this isn't the terrifying story of the silent twin that is literally what true crime youtubers name their video on this case the terrifying story of the silent twins like that is so 
disrespectful to not only June, who has made so much progress, but also Jennifer, who has passed away. And you're almost discounting the amount of progress that these girls went through to unlearn their behaviors from such a traumatic childhood. Not only is it ignorance, but it is false information. I feel like this story needs to be told properly because not only does it confront racism, but it also confronts mental health. And by not telling the true story and by trying to spin it into a scary story, you are actively trying to not confront racism and not confront mental health in a real and honest way just to get more viewers. And I know that I'm gonna get so many comments being like, why does she have such an attitude? Because I do have an attitude about this case and I, you know, just, Whatever. Another thing is that YouTubers like to say that this all happened when June and Jennifer were like either still children or teenagers. No. This happened well into their 30s. Like, stop trying to make things sound scary by making it... Oh, listen, honestly, sir. They like to use black and white photos of when these girls were babies. And listen, I love Hayley Reese, but this is not a ghost story. And I'm so sick of YouTubers discounting the amount of progress that these girls made just to make it seem like a scary ghost story. It is not. And I really hope June is living her best life. And as a child of trauma myself, I, I don't know, I, like I really resonate with this story and it makes me emotional when people don't give these girls the, you know, accolades that they freaking deserve from going through what they went through. I'm so sorry that this is not the scary case True Crime Sunday that you were expecting from me this week, but honestly, this is probably one of the cases that I am most passionate about. Like, I seriously feel like I'm just... Mm. Anyways, yes. So, yes. That was this week's True Crime Sunday. I don't always have an attitude, but when it comes to stuff like this, I do. But if you like my vibe, I would honestly love to have you on my team. We do True Crime Sundays every single Sunday. We do also do scary stories, but only when they are true scary stories, not when they're made up. And we also do story times on my life, on other people's lives. We do mukbangs. We do lots of stuff on this channel. So if you like my vibe, click subscribe, hit the like button because it really actually, truly, honestly, truly does help this channel. And thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.